Felix here. Good evening from Hong Kong. A happy Saturday morning to most of you. I appreciate you joining in for this weekend special. I love these Saturday lives because we get to talk about things a little bit more kind of peace and quiet without the stock prices rallying up and down. So it's a great opportunity to kind of question and ask things and, and think about what's happening next week. So let me show you. I've got a little bit of a plan here, but I'm very happy to be thrown off course by your questions. Uh, we've got data out that China is once again pulled substantially ahead of Europe in terms of EV sales. We also have more sort of COVID news out of China. The China Chengdu Auto Show, which is one of the biggest ones, just got cancelled. We have Tesla's Model Y using BYD batteries. That's an interesting twist, isn't it? DD, I think that business model is being shattered. And then I also want to briefly look at why I think Ride and Workhouse are on the way out. Uh, speaking of, of businesses who are uh, struggling, we can look at a little bit new pre-earnings. That's coming up on the 11th. So make sure you join me for that earnings call there. And of course, your questions, as always, which is the most important part here, really. Uh, Walid, Nicholas, Eric, um, welcome to the call. Great to have you on here. As always, I truly appreciate your little subscribes and your likes. And we are almost at 24,000. Can you believe it for the channel? I'm very, very excited by that. Um, and here's a second, Nicholas. Uh, lots of you are on the call here. Uh, be aware, Patrick, Andy uh, from the UK. When will these institutions let Neo rip? Well, earnings are coming up. We can definitely go through that a bit here. And of course, i answer everything as well. MC, a huge welcome to you there. So let me show you this little chart here. So this is the share of EV cells globally. And what, ca what can you see? Well, this orange line up here is China. And I'm using my, my magic pen. <laughs> and, and the blue line here is, is basically Europe. I'm going to call it the EU for now. Although I know the two are not the same. It's not a political statement. And then we have down here at about 12% we have the US of A. And the EU, just to put the number in, is about 38% global market share and China about 47 So you can see that, yeah, just about. I'm going to change the pen to something a little bit more serious. So what does that mean? Well, you can see why Tesla is in China and in Europe aggressively because that is 88% of the market, basically. Is that 70? Not quite, right? 70, 85 percent of the market. And there's obviously a bit for the rest of the world. So those two markets matter. And that's why I like companies like Neo, who are already at home in the 47 percent market and now moving into the 38 percent market share market. And for this moment, ignoring the US, because at the moment, in terms of volume, it's a bit of an irrelevance. Now, that might change with, you know, Biden and more infrastructure and more incentives and tax credits and all these things, or the infrastructure bill that apparently U.S. lawmakers work Saturdays. Um, if you can confirm that, if you're in the U.S., let me know. Um, Baron loved the drop on Friday. <laughs> um, Patrick says, take off the weekend. So I, I, I'm not live on Sundays and Mondays. I take those days to work on, on courses, on materials, on, on other things. Uh, but I, I'm live usually Tuesday to Saturday. So. Um, and Jan is asking about Kaishin Auto. Okay, we can um, have a look at that in a second. And Baron is saying basically the higher inflation numbers that we might well get will cause more of a tech correction. So we've had now... For the first time this year, actually really quite good job numbers, better than expected, and better than expected job numbers lead to what? Well, we can we can make a little a little flow chart here if you like. Uh, essentially, if you have more jobs, and there's more jobs data coming out on Monday and Tuesday, by by, by the way, that essentially increases two things. It increases wages. Uh, because there is more of a of a squeeze there, and at the same time, well, it does a second thing really, which is um, it um, removes the Fed argument, basically, um, you know, reason for uh, for 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 um, money printing. 
so this is my my money printing there. So that's what they keep been, been saying again and again and again. And in the last week, we've had two or three Fed chairs who've all been saying, well, we shouldn't be waiting. We should get to tapering. And if the employment data is better than expected, we should jump on it. So that seems much more likely now that they're meeting again in August. So that seems much more likely. And um, this here, of course, also creates more inflation, uh, which is the other problem that we might see. If we see real wage inflation, we're going to get some data, I think, on Monday or Tuesday on that, then that would again feed into this uh, or remove this Fed's argument of, you know, we can wait, we can wait. No one will believe that anymore. So I think we might see bond yields increase a little bit more and we might see a bit more pressure on the growth stocks that have sort of performed the best. So there is a little bit of that uh, going on there. Is it the end of the world, though? Is this mean, does it mean it's the end of the market and all that sort of thing? No, I don't think so. I think it'll be a, a temporary um, situation there. Um, and Baron, you're absolutely right on what you just said there on, on tapering. I totally agree with that. Uh, and Eric, to me, that is also largely the cause of the dip on Friday because it wasn't just Neo, it wasn't just Palantir, it was absolutely everything. And let me show you that on a chart here. Um, if you haven't yet gone to my website, go to Academy and taken this free five part mini stock course to improve your investment returns. What are you waiting for? Jump on there right now. It's go to academy.org. And let me pull up a chart here to show you what I'm talking about. Um, in the meantime, I'll copy and paste you that link in here. Clicking a link easier than typing it. And if we if we throw in QQQ in here, it, and, and just sort of zoom in a little bit. Hang on. Can we... Uh, wait, while I'm fighting with, with, the, with the stock here. But what you can see... What you could see till a second ago uh, is you see that little orange line here? That's the QQQ, right? And that went down yesterday. So did pretty much every growth stock out there. So it's just the market. To me, that makes the move less important because it's a market sentiment issue. It isn't stock related. It isn't specific to NEO. It is largely just the market feeling a little bit, a little bit worried. Um, Pete, uh, Hilma wants to talk about the SEC statements on Chinese stocks. Okay, we can definitely do that. So what I will do is I will make a little list over here about things to talk about so I don't forget. So SEC, absolutely, uh, on, on, on China, we will definitely do that. Uh, and Powell talks one day before the Palantir earnings and CPI comes out two days before earnings of Palantir, Baron. Yeah, so whenever Powell talks, it generally isn't the greatest thing for the market. I think we've become used to that uh, for now. Um, and Peter is asking, will you buy more Palantir uh, 20s or waiting until earnings? For me, I'm going to wait until earnings because I want to see that there is some actual momentum in this. If, if, if I buy something and my money just sits there for six months, I'm losing money. I'm losing the opportunity cost of buying something that is actually going to move. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait a little bit there. Um, and Baron thinks we're going to have a pump Monday. We might well have that Monday reaction to Friday and then see it turned around with a little bit of economic data as well. So again, let me show you the data that's going to come out on um, at the beginning of the week. So on Monday, we have more job openings numbers. And then on Tuesday, we have labor costs. Uh, and that is also important in terms of inflation. So the more labor cost goes up, the worse that is for inflation and the faster we're going to see tapering, right? So that's definitely something to keep an eye, eye out. Uh, Nicholas is asking about Palantir put option leaps. You know what? I never trade leaps, I, I, I must say, because I find it very difficult to predict things that far in advance with high probability. What 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 do the um, what's the probability on, on on those trades? That's really what I would look at. I generally only trade options that are sort of seventy percent plus probability. So um, I, I'll show you in a second what, what what might be an idea for Neo, for example. But let's run through a little bit here the, uh, the the news I have on the screen, and you're very welcome 
to um, uh, Blake, huge welcome to you there. I, I know you were asking some questions on the Discord earlier. Thank you for that as well. Uh, feel free to ask questions, guys. I will keep an eye on it and I'll keep uh, adding them on here on our little list to make sure we cover them. So the Chinese Changdu Auto Show, which is a big one because most car manufacturers are, or component manufacturers are based up there in, in Chengdu, was cancelled with the announcement that COVID is really quite severe in Sichuan province, which is the province around Chengdu. So that is sort of not great news from that COVID side of the world. Tesla is using BYD batteries in their Model Y. And that was news to me. Uh, I was very surprised by that. And let me show you the actual article. Here we go. So the Model Y will be powered by BYD's Blade battery. And they'll do that from the second quarter of next year. And they're apparently testing it at present. Apparently, it will not catch fire. And it was it's first used in their Han EV model, which is a pretty uh, successfully selling model. So Tesla diversifying their supply chain there, or they can't get their hand on enough, or is it just a better, cheaper battery? It's kind of interesting that they're buying from BYD. I didn't really have them on the market as somebody who might sell batteries to other brands. I thought they would need to use them all for themselves, but apparently not. So it's an interesting uh, play there on, on, on BYD, a stock that's definitely very much overlooked. Um, uh, so Angel, I think I just answered your question there. Lol, you wrote it. <laughs> you thought it. I thought it. Uh, there we have it. So that's good. Uh, now, Didi. Ah, Didi. I, poor Didi, basically. Uh, that's the way I, I look at this. Uh, there is lots of news out in the Chinese press. I hit translate on some of these articles. Uh, so there was this, this rumor that Didi would transfer their data into a third-party company, which might be government-owned. And that was denied. And we still don't really quite know what's going to happen. The headlines I see still are full of it, uh, but they have denied it. Uh, but I'm still a little bit cautious with it because we had lots of rumors around uh, Alibaba and Ant, for example. And generally speaking, a lot of those came true. Uh, actually, pretty much all of those came true. It was just initially no comment. And then sort of we, we kind of got that. So if that is what's happening there, then they have less market share, more competition. and I think one of them once here sort of summed it up quite nicely. Um, uh, let me see if I can find it now. Obviously, now I cannot find it. Uh, that's that's what happens when you want to show something. But either way, I'll, I'll, I, I tell you what, what it said. I, it basically said uh, that as part of this rectification process, they have to lower costs pay drivers more and obviously be data compliant. And for a business that is already not profitable, this isn't really a great thing. And if they will not be able to use their data, because that to me, that's the only place they could actually really make money because at the moment, 90% market share not making money. That's a concern. So I, I, I don't love that for DD. I think this is really quite bad news for, for, for DD, the stock. So I, I, I don't know. I'll be very cautious on that. Uh, I also think I wanted to just put it on here in writing for once. I know I talk about ride sometimes and also workhorse. I think both of them are stocks I would not touch. I don't have them. If I did, I'd definitely sell them, no matter what the price. Uh, ride lied about pre-orders, CEO, CFO, ousted. We got a, a Department of Justice investigation. And the problem with all of that, it could all be overcome with money, you might think, right? You just say they find another investor and, and they've got cash again, great. But you have to ask yourself, who are the brightest engineers and where are they going to go and work? Are they going to go and work at Ride or are they going to go and work at Tesla or maybe even Ford or GM companies without this stigma, without this problem, without possibly going out of business, without government investigations? The smartest and brightest people leave first and you can't hire anymore. That's the real problem with, with a situation like Ride. And I think for that reason, personally, I think they're going to go into bankruptcy. And I think Workhorse will go the same direction direction. Um, I think a rival is basically you won that space. I, I don't think Workhorse is uh, going to necessarily recover. And I think, again, it, they all rely on having really great engineers, essentially. And how do you attract those if you are you know, you didn't get any of the contracts that we thought you were going to get. So I'd be very, very cautious on those. And, and bear in mind what happened to the dot-com stocks, right? 50% of them went out of business. That looked beautiful and shiny at, the, at, the, at that moment. So when there is something in the EV space that is looking a little bit fishy, I would 
go and go to a safer haven for, to, to look for my, uh, my returns. Um, uh, while it wants to talk about uh, SoFi, okay, we can definitely also do that. Let me just write it down over here and we will get to that in just a moment. Uh, Michael, uh, good morning to you as well. Now, let's look a little bit at Neo pre-earnings. I'm actually going to put out a full video on that. So if you, um, you want to really dig into that, watch out for that video coming out later. But I just posted a couple of things in the Discord community earlier. Here it is, which I think is quite insightful. This is the key thing I'm going to look out for. And that is the purple line. It's Neo's gross profit margin. So we saw that improve from the last quarter, the previous quarter, from 11% to 15.7% last quarter. And that was largely because the 100 kilowatt hour battery was more widely available, and that's more profitable for Neo. And we've been told that they're delivering those. I'm just going to crank up my aircon here. It's absolutely roasting. Uh, that they have them now in, in, or they're delivering them to all battery swap stations, which basically means they've got lots of them. So that means a lot of the EVs that were delivered last month or last quarter will have that 100 kilowatt hour battery. So how far can we go? Can we get to like, you know, 18% margins or something like that gross? That would be really tremendous. And similarly with the EBIT margins, they're still sitting at about minus 14.6% here, but they were, you know, minus 25, 20, 30 or something the quarter before. So again, that's, I think, the improvement that we're going to look for. We have a pretty good idea of what revenue will be, but these, to me, are the numbers that will actually matter here. So if you want to see what earnings estimates are, it's this. It's basically minus 9, plus nine cents, and we're expecting 1.285 billion revenue. Uh, the best way to watch this, guys, is uh, join me on that live call that's already on my channel. You can just hit that set reminder button. And they are truly insightful, these earnings calls, if you haven't joined me on one before, because you get to hear the bank analysts ask those insightful questions. And you can kind of read between the lines what they are worried about uh, and, and what they are not. Um, Patrick's got an interesting question here on on currency. Uh, do you de invest in different markets and currencies to diversify and not be invested in a single currency? I think, okay, the risk, the most risk-free thing to do is to invest only in your home currency, the currency that you earn and spend your money in. That would be the, the most risk-free thing to do. If you, for some reason, earn in one currency and live in another, then you kind of, you should probably still if you wanted to pick one, pick the one you're spending in, because that sort of is, matters more. Personally, I don't think currencies matter all that much. Uh, if you are, say, invested in some pounds, some euros, some US dollars, if you are buying really, truly good companies, the outcome over, say, a 10-year period isn't really going to be determined, determined massively by, by currency movements. It'll be by earnings. So I don't think it matters that much. Personally, I wouldn't split it actively to get exposure to lots of cur currencies. I'd rather try to do the opposite. Uh, but uh, that's my, my thought on that. Investry, um, hello, there's a cat out of the box. Uh, Andres says, buy Xnet. Uh, that's his tip from the Netherlands. All right. So why don't we go through a couple of these questions I have on the chart here. And I forgot to mention in its entirety that I have a new course out and it's called Double Your Income in 14 Days. And I'm really excited about this. I've worked on this for weeks and weeks. And it is not an investment course. It is a course to teach you how to build that side business, get that passive income and do it without working on it all the time to really automate it and set it up. And that is at the moment still in the pre-sale because it's about to be launched in two weeks. Uh, so take advantage of that 40% off coupon uh, double income. I launched it last night on the live call and already guys are joining it, which is super exciting. So the community for that is also growing. And have a look on that link. It's also on my website. Uh, I'll just show it to you briefly here. So if you go to my website, you can click on... on on learn more down here and you see that offer to so the first 100 of you who sign up will get that pre-sale offer after that obviously the discount is not going to stay at 40 percent that would not be sustainable but if you yeah just click on that and, and you'll basically get to see all the details listen to my little video on here i really explained it uh, what it's all about but essentially it is to 
give you that extra income, whether you want to buy that house or go on that trip or you want to plow it into the market and allow yourself to compound that into millions of dollars over time. Uh, that's basically what I teach you in this. You don't have to have a business idea. You don't have to have a knack for running businesses. I break it down step by step so you can do it. And you can do this in two weeks. Um, that's that's the promise. So check that out uh, on, on, on the website on Goat Academy as well. Um, Jesper is asking about the possible merger um, with uh, Guggenheim and Polestar and also the XPang status, status. So the Guggenheim Polestar, we haven't really got any more um, rumors on that. It's just the rumor at present. It hasn't progressed in the sort of public eye. Uh, I think if it does happen, it's going to be a very interesting one. I like Pol Polestar a great deal but we don't know any more yet. So would I buy the SPAC on that? Not necessarily, because I don't know if that's actually going to happen. So, Brian, thank you very much for the like. We only need 50 more likes to get to 100 likes, which is what makes this officially a uh, respectable call. So, so please keep smashing that like button. And then um, XPang status, uh, Jasper, anything specific you are, you are referring to there? Is there something you want to look at? Um, one thing I wanted to show you for Neo pre-earnings. So if you are somebody who does options trading, you will understand what this is. But if you don't, I just want to give you a very brief glimpse here. So this is a straddle. And it's a strange name. I appreciate that. But what it allows you to do is make profit on Neo between $40 and $48, what I'm drawing in here. In this whole range, you are making money. And that's pretty unusual. You can't do that with stocks, right? So say this is our stock chart up here and you are making money whether this goes up or down as long as it stays between $40 and $48 approximately. And what does this trade cost you? It costs you nothing at all. In fact, you get cash up front. You get $393 up front. And why did I pick this? Because I know from history, and the history is right here, that Neo the day after earnings typically goes down sort of 3 to 5% in, in the last couple of quarters. So in here, I'm allowing myself about a 10% decline. And this options expires on the 13th. So just a day and a bit after, well, literally one trading day after the earnings are, are released. So you can do these quite exciting things with, with, um, with options. You could, of course, also do the opposite. And you could say, so if, if, say, if this is your stock price and you could say, well, I think it's going to either go up or down, but it's not going to stay in the middle, then I'm going to draw a little box in the middle here and exclude that and say in here, I'm not making money, but I'm making money above it and I'm making money below it. I'm, I'm covering with that with my head. Uh, but you see, you see what I mean? So you can put this little box in the middle and say, if it moves within very narrow range here. I'm not making money, but I'm moving, making money if it goes up or down, say 3% or 5%. So you can, you can do some interesting stuff uh, with that. Uh, Jan says, don't forget your margin. Um, well, yes, you, you, are, you are completely right. Your loss on this is in theory unlimited. So there will be some impact on your margin account. So you will not be able to make this the biggest trade in the world, but one Call it one one trade of this would be three hundred ninety three dollars. Um, you could do things to limit your losses, which would possibly reduce your margin costs there. So there are things you can do to make this a bit more sophisticated. But that becomes a little bit too complicated to explain this here briefly to um, possibly people who, who don't already trade options. And if that sounds interesting to you, again, of course, I have a course on options trading. So, so check that out. Um, and that also comes with a 29% coupon, Build Wealth. So again, go down to the link below, felixfriends.org slash join, and you can learn options trading from scratch as well. Now, Richard, thank you for joining us. Good morning to you in California. Um, and do you think Lucid is a good buyer? 22 says Angel. All right, we could definitely look at that. So let me add some of the things you guys are shouting out here to our lovely list. So we'll put Lucid on there. Um, and Let's dig into a couple of these. So don't be shy if you want to ask questions. Okay, let me explain the first one here, the SECC uh, China story, which um, I 
forgot to ask about it now. But what that's essentially about is that at the moment, if you are a Chinese company, you cannot issue securities in the United States. So you can't issue debt bonds, convertible bonds, shares at present. And that is until you make further disclosures. So you're going to have to write a few more legal ease paragraphs about something or other. We don't know what the something or other is. The SEC haven't defined it. Likely it'll have to do more with variable interest entities and with American depository shares and just the way they work and more on risk. I, I looked yesterday in the NEO uh, listing prospectus and I think it mentions variable interest entity like 98 times or something like that. So it's pretty out there it's pretty disclosed already it's just people don't read it but so it'd be interesting to see what the sec comes up with here that might make people actually take notice i don't know if people will but that's essentially that so to me is that a terribly scary thing no because they're just saying we're going to ask for an extra disclosure they could have gone further but they haven't they're just saying give us more data give us more information so that's really all that is about um Brendan wants a deep dive in in ARVL. Okay, that's an interesting one. I, I agree with you on that. Let's um, make a note of that. And I'll put, put in the little corner here, DD. It's as a note for myself. Uh, hard to do a proper DD uh, in, in about five minutes on the air. We can have a go at it. We can have a look at some of their numbers, see what we can come up with. Um, and... Paths are asking price target for NEO end of the year. Okay, we can definitely also look at that. So... Neo price target. So we've done the SEC. Let's look at SoFi. Let's find a find a chart to start with here. And what have we got here? So we've got SoFi yesterday. Was it yesterday? It was yesterday, wasn't it? Uh, having going up four percent, so it's having a nice rally here. Uh, despite the market in my little orange line here is QQQ, despite the market going the other way. And that, of course, is, is exactly what you want to see. Um, what we have also done is we have gone, you see these great big red arrows that I put in there sometime last week before this rally. That was the peak of the previous market, and we didn't manage to break through it, and now we have. So that's good news. So actually, this now acts as a support line. So that's sort of 16, 64 or thereabouts. That is now support. So I'm going to make that, can I make that green to indicate support? So that's kind of what's going to hold us up somewhat in a, in a, in a positive sense. And what's the next real resistance on the way up? Well, it's this little orange line up here, which is our 100-day moving average, which is, let me put a little flag in there for that as well. That's sitting around 1777. So I'm going to make that red to, to indicate it's a resistance on the way up. So that's, for me, really the real break it, make it or break it test on the way up. Uh, it's another dollar and a bit to go. Now, we do, of course, have earnings coming up in um, in just a couple of days, 12th of August. Uh, unfortunately, they're, I think, at like four in the morning or something, my time. So 5 p.m., I think, New York time. So I won't be able to do a live on that, but you, sh you should listen to it if you are interested in SoFi because, as always, the chat between management and just getting that feeling, that sense for how they answer those analyst questions is really, really priceless. Um, it's just, just, just like MasterCard, isn't it? Price is it Visa or is it Mastercard with the priceless uh, adverts? Uh, and we have, as I also here, broken out of that little channel which I'd drawn in. So I, I'd previously drawn in this sort of channel here between 15 and 1660. So uh, this is a good move. Uh, it really matters whether on Monday, whether we fall back into this channel, do we fall back below 1664 and that way we just continue treading water sideways or are we actually breaking out of this? That's really the question. It's a little bit too early to tell at this point. Moment volume was a little bit less on Monday. So that's not super. You want to want volume to be a little bit higher. If we look at momentum that has turned positive so that 
this little green line down here is the zero mark for momentum. So we are moving into positivity, but we're not like massively into positivity. I mean, it could be, it's, it's one, it could be six, it could be seven, it could be 10, right? So it could be a little bit higher. So we're still a little bit on the edge here uh, there. Um, do you think the listing in Hong Kong will help new stock to grow or just buy uh, and help sell? Um, I don't think in itself it moves the stock, no. I think it's a smart way of raising some money and it somewhat risks, it reduces their risk and they will hopefully be able to uh, get connected to that southbound connect so that mainland Chinese retail investors can put money into NEO uh, more easily. So I think that will be the obvious advantage there. Walid says, um, what do you think about Astra Space, Rocket Lab, and SpaceX IPOs? So I've looked a little bit at this. I haven't done a proper deep dive on it, so I don't really want to give an opinion without having done that. Um, actually, Tom Nash did a video on Astra Space, I think, yesterday, uh, which I haven't seen yet either, but you might want to check that out. Um, he's got a, got, a, got a reasonable head on his shoulders, so that might be one to look at. But I, I will also dig a little bit deeper into that because you are not the first to ask about that, so I will definitely look at that. Um, Astra Rocket. Thanks for for doing my uh, my <laughs> work for me here. Uh, I, I will have a little bit of a look at that. Um, so Simal, JD, look, I think it's a brilliant company. I think it is very undervalued at present. I, I think huge growth, huge free cash flow, very profitable and, and, and all that. But I don't think it's going to go anywhere in the next six months, just like the whole China tech space, with the exception of EVs. I think the whole other China tech space is struggling. Look, Meituan is getting a billion dollar plus fine, right? So JD isn't really going to move. Alibaba just announced they think their taxes are going to go up. So, you know, do you think that isn't going to happen to JD? All of those things happen to all of them because... JD was doing the same shenanigans that Baba was doing and that Matron is now getting fined for. So it's just a question of time till they are the ones in the headlines. So uh, I, I would say great company, but not necessarily a, a, an urgency to jump in on it. I think there is time for this. Um, and Patrick also wants me to add the um, red wire to this. Okay, it might, might be interesting to do a, to do a proper space video. Uh, we're going to space. SoFi, yeah, so we just talked about SoFi. Uh, Lucid, <laughs> look, I think I think if you look at just this, just sort of step back a moment and you just think, well, an American EV, purely made in the US, it's premium, it's good quality, good backing, good investors, sounds brilliant, doesn't it? The people will lap it up once it works, if it works, if it doesn't go up in flames and doesn't run out of money. Now, they're much less likely to run out of money because they've got serious backers. And presumably, they will be able to do something, put a decent car out. But manufacturing is a huge risk. Uh, ramping up manufacturing is difficult. Supply chain is hugely difficult at present. And there isn't all that much of it in the United States, to be quite frank, right? A lot of it is in, is in, is in, in, in China and, and Taiwan and Japan and places. So if you're really small, it is actually not that easy to get your hands on that, particularly if you are new. So the question really is, is this like Tesla 15 years ago, which is why people are interested in it, or is this just a more high-risk Tesla that could go out of business? So I think that's really the, the, the fundamentally underlying question here. Um, is it worth, you know, what's the market cap now? 37 billion uh, when they haven't sold a thing. Uh, so they are, they are, it's definitely not cheap. Uh, that, that, that's what I would say. Um, so I think it's not really about like what are the technical saying? Where are we exactly on the chart? That sort of thing. It's more what's your fundamental belief in that management? Uh, do you have 100% faith in that CEO? Do you think they can pull this off? Because it's a big thing to pull off, to build a new car company. And they are a little bit late to the party. I think we have to also admit that. 
Um, Richard does not like uh, the CEO, Rawlinson. I, look, I don't know the chap. I don't know anything about him. But whenever I watch a video with him doing a presentation, I somehow cringe. That's just my reaction to it. For that reason, I'm not buying it. I'm, I'm with you on that, Richard. Uh, I don't know if there is something in his background or something that made you come to that conclusion for other reasons than what your, your gut is telling me, you. But for me, I, I listen to those um, instinctive reactions. And if that's also why I love listening to earnings calls, because I get to hear the management. And if the management does doesn't sound the right way. I, I, I literally sell the stock and that might sound crazy to you, but to me, it sort of works whether I feel comfortable with it or not. And Patrick says they've promised production since 2019. Um, and yeah, that's an issue. Uh, so no production there. So, you know, we have Ride also. We have a lot of other companies that are going to go out of business. I mean, if you look at this from a on paper, who's backed them, how they've gone through it and, and all of that, it all looks very good. It's a very good, sleek presentation. But where is the production? So um, I, I, I would rather put my money into Tesla, say, because at least I know they're manufacturing, they're selling, they're going to be one of the market leaders for sure. Uh, Investory says, come on, everybody, smash the like button. We only need 17 more likes to get 100 likes. Let's, let's go triple digit here. And... Let me go through your um, further questions. You are very welcome, guys, to ask questions. Just hit the subscribe button and then you can go on the live chat here. Uh, Neo, uh, Neo price target. Okay, for that, I'm going to pull up our Patreon because that's where it's at. Uh, and if you go in there and you click on DCF, so you can click on Neo as well, and you see those DD, Uber, DCFs, etc. Alibaba, here's Neo. So this is my sort of regular case Neo discounted cash flow model, which takes me to about $98. Now, it's a 10-year model. That does not mean it's a price target for in 10 years. It means it's a price target for about 12 months. So I think your question was, was it at the end of the year? I have no idea. Uh, I think it'll hopefully move in the right direction because I think Q3 and Q4 numbers will be very good. But really, I think where the excitement will be will be 2022 because that is when we get ET7 delivered, uh, possibly a new sedan, uh, at least going into production, and things will really ramp up into a different level. I think also autonomous driving will be much further. I think the um, Winter Olympics will be a cause to show off autonomous driving to the world and, and Chinese technology. So I think that will push and, and hurry along all this um, regulatory stuff that we are seeing much, much faster. So that's my fair value about a, about a year out, so 12 months out. If you want to get a little bit, dig a little bit deeper into that, you're very welcome to check that out on the Patreon. Um, Patrick says, it's bankrupt Felix with likes for the fluffy creatures. Uh, I would truly appreciate that. Um, uh, if you haven't seen that yet, uh, I, I for every... Um for every one of your likes, guys, I, I donate one cent to the Gentle Barn American uh, Animal Sanctuary, and they're based in California, I think, I want to say South Carolina and somewhere else, uh, but um, they, they, they do a really good job. So far, I've sent them $1,453, so I keep doing that every single month. And Investry, talking about chip shortage, uh, you think it's it's going to be a good year 2022? I think so too. I, I think the chip shortage is going to be largely behind us. I saw an article out earlier. Let me see if I still have that open. Um, no, I don't. Uh, which basically shows that most of the chip manufacturers think the chip shortage, the biggest part of it, will be over by the end of this year. So uh, Neo also said that it would be over by July. So, you know, we the, the, the proof is in the August number pudding, really. Um, um, Nicholas says it's insane to buy... Uh, WMT for exposure to JD and Flipkart. Feels like a way to buy into growth at cheap multiples, but stock doesn't really move. Yeah, I mean, I think I think Chinese equities are not really going to move much this year, with the exception of EVs. I, I really think that they won't, and that's not because I don't like them, and I think they are good businesses. It's just, it's just the regulatory stuff. It's just going to overhang on sentiment here uh, tremendously. So we still need nine likes to get to 100. Uh, can we do that? Can we do that in a couple of minutes? I think we probably could if there was enough will behind it. 
So we've talked Lucid, we've talked Neo price target. Uh, let me do a quick recap here for anyone who's just joined us. So this lovely chart up here, in orange, you have the China market share of all EVs sold in the world, and it's 47% of all EVs sold in the world are sold in China. 38% of all EVs made in the first half of 2021 were sold in Europe and only 12% in the United States. So you can see why from a, an investing point of view and from a stock picking point of view, uh, the ones with China and Europe exposure are the ones that matter. Uh, the US actually isn't that important at this point. Now, you could also look at it the other way around and say, well, the US has growth opportunities. And yes, it does, but it'll take some time. Patrick says maybe Chinese solar is pretty immune as well. I think the whole kind of China green sector is definitely bolstered. But you there again get into sort of a public good, right? So a little bit like education or something like that. How much profit is the right profit for society? I think that's what you have to look at with Chinese stocks. Is this something that might go against the benefit to society ultimately. Uh, Blake says, why does Neo's price fall 3 to 5% after earnings in the past? Yeah, it's a funny one, really. Uh, there is, if I can find it, here it is. So you can see on this chart here, the earnings per share, whether we have beaten expectations or not. We did for three out of the last four quarters. Uh, each time yet, the, the, the share price went down. It's just one of those things. I, I, I don't really know why. It's, uh, it's sort of this, uh, you know, buy the rumor, sell the news type thing. It happens with Tesla as well, for example. Not particularly logical, but that's just, you know, I can just tell you what the numbers say. It doesn't make a great deal of sense to sell a stock that's just outperformed to me. But then if you are a short-term trader or options trader, it might. So that's perhaps where that volatility kicks in. There is typically volatility on earnings. And a lot of that will also come from the options world because um, it's, it's a really easy trade for people to do and make some money on fairly consistently. If you do that four times a year, you do it with a basket of stocks, uh, you can probably pull off some 70, 80% returns there on, 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 on those trades. So it's, 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 a, it's a good one to understand how that works. What are your feelings on COVID? It's a boring subject. I appreciate that. But the Chinese auto show in Chengdu, which is one of the biggest ones, just got cancelled. I just saw the announcement basically citing that COVID was very serious in the province. So I know in America, I don't know, 2.2 million people just flew this weekend or something like that. Uh, but is that just going to get worse? Are we going to go back to lockdowns this autumn? And will we therefore see another recovery in things like Facebook and Amazon and so on and other stocks getting hammered because people are not going out? Uh, Afa is saying, will China's push for carbon neutrality benefit steel companies? My knowledge of the steel sector in China is quite a few years old. And I was working as an investment bank here, and then China couldn't make enough steel to manufacture to, to build all the infrastructure. So as far as I'm aware, they were never really a, a big scale exporter of, of steel. I think it was all for domestic consumption. So I don't know. I would look up the export statistics or import statistics. That might be easier for you uh, to into the US how much steel is the US import importing there. So I think that was kind of the issue uh, at the time. Uh, so I don't know if that will be a big boon, therefore, for, for American companies. Steel is a pretty heavy thing to move, so I don't know how far that gets exported around the world. Um, if I, but, but it's an interesting question. Of how I think it's definitely one worth digging into. Wayne, okay, there's that Bank of America article. Yeah, I read that. That was an incredibly positive piece of news. They were basically saying that there will not be a single battery left by 2025. Uh, so there is a battery shortage. We've already had it for the last six months. It's just been overshadowed by the chip shortage. It does seem to be improving somewhat, though. You have massive expenditure by an investment by companies like CATL, for example, the largest battery manufacturer in the world. And they seem to be fairly confident that they can meet demand. 
uh, Neo just got the 100 kilowatt battery out. Yeah, six months late in, in, in on a mass scale. True. And that is the shortage. It makes things late, but it doesn't mean they don't have batteries to manufacture. So I think it's a bit of a negative uh, take on that. I think it's a long period of time as well. I think you can scale up battery manufacturing relatively quickly, certainly more quickly than, say, chips. Um, okay, we got 100 likes. That's that's something worth celebrating. Thank you there, Investry. Uh, I pretty, pretty, really appreciate that. Uh, Richard says, any opinion on cassava science? I don't know, but let's look it up. Why don't we, we do a dig on one? Uh, let me pull up Finbox here. I'll show it to you as well. So, cassava sciences. Let's see if they've got any numbers out. So here we have a bit of an earnings history. They um, okay, they're losing money a little bit. We are expecting them to lose more money this quarter than last quarter, and they are generally yeah sort of all right. Uh, stock price reaction after earnings massively volatile, 10, 12 percent up each time. It's a great opportunity for some uh, for some. Um, Options trading here. Earnings per share estimates are improving ever so slightly here. I don't know where they fell off, but let's have a quick look at their. Um, we can do a comparison to see what who else is in that space. It's you know the the trouble with these sort of science pharmaceutical companies is you can't tell very much from the numbers because they are typically not making anything yet, right? So at the moment. They haven't even got an operating income margin. There isn't one, uh, and everything is negative. So difficult to judge from numbers. Therefore, it really comes down to understanding their science and what they're making, how smart they are, how likely they are to succeed. And, well, is it just is it, is it a good idea? Is it one you can actually profit from? Is it one you can sell? Is there a market for it? Will regulators like it? So that's really the challenge, which is why I'm not massively into these kind of pharmaceutical or healthcare companies because I just don't really understand them. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a, you know medically trained. So I leave it to people who are. Uh, if you have an investment manager you trust who is that way inclined, I think that's probably the smarter way of doing it. So I think if you want exposure to that, I'd find the smartest guy around with a focused portfolio just on this and just pay them the, the 1% or the you know management fee a year. And at least that way, it, it, there's somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, I, I know ARK obviously covers quite a lot of these stocks as well. I don't know if, if they hold this one. But yeah, I think it's a really tricky one to, to invest in these. It's It becomes complete gambling if you don't understand uh, what's going on there. Um. Uh, Corey, um, I, I'm very glad you're joining us too. It's fantastic. I'm glad you are watching the NEO coverage. Uh, I've actually put out a video later which goes through pre-earnings, so check that out. I hope you will enjoy that. Thank you very much. Um, while it is asking about Palantir, everyone's always lamenting the um, share-based compensation. It's, it's, it doesn't look good. I think that's just the reality of it. We know it's here to stay. It was in the S1 IPO filing. Uh, there are, it's, it's a massive amount of, of, of shares that they are going to put out there. Again, let me, let me show you that here because it's on the Patreon. If you click on Palantir, I dug into this a while back uh, when we had a bit of a debate on this. Look, there are 1.3 billion shares uh, that will be essentially issued to insiders over the next, I think, eight years or so. So there are all these options and incentive plans. Uh, and yeah, that will cause dilution. And if they keep selling them each time for uh, tax reasons, it will also kind of hold back the, the, sh the stock somewhat. Um, absolutely. Now, put on here where you can look it up, uh, the equity incentive plan. It's, it's, it's outlined in all the filings. So it isn't, it isn't a secret, but it's pretty, pretty substantial. I mean, if you look at, here it is. This is um, the selling so far. Does it give us a summary? No, but you can see just how many trades that is, right? An absolute boatload. Oh, here it is. Total sales so far, 1.8 billion US dollars by insiders. Now, 
you can argue, well, it retains them, they own it, they've been working for not that much money for however many years, and I totally get that. Um, and I can totally understand also why they're selling, because they get a hefty tax bill. Uh, but you have to just think about it, uh, how it looks to an outsider who's looking at Palantir for the first time. On my checklist, one of the things I look for is are uh, insiders buying back shares. That's what I like to see. This one does not tick that box. And that way, that, therefore, it'll put off quite a lot of people. So I, I do think it's an issue. I, I, I think it, it'll continue to be. Um, and uh, Gmail is asking, there, why is Carp selling? When he gets... The way that's set up, the way it's structured isn't really very ideal. He gets paid a salary of, I think it's 2 million US a year. I can't quite remember. It was a low million dollar figure, which isn't all that much for a, you know, Silicon Valley or wherever he is, a CEO. And then he gets like, you know, a billion dollars in options. On that billion dollars, he gets a tax bill, which is pretty substantial, maybe, I don't know, 400 million or something like that. So he hasn't got the 400 million, so he's got to sell to pay the tax bill. And that's what happens each time those, those options vest. So you can understand why he's selling it, but it doesn't look great for the, for the stock. It just isn't... The way it's set up is it's cheap for the company to pay him a billion dollars without actually paying him a billion dollars. They just print some shares. And that won't cost them all that much. And it'll cost them a little bit in tax, but not that much. Um, Gross Kennedy, thank you very much. You're very kind. Uh, Eric says, have a look at Visa stock, please. Sure. Chart or numbers? Uh, have you have a preference? Let's start with the chart here. Um, I like Visa, I must say. I, I, have, I have a fair bit of Visa. What's going on with this chart here? There we go. Okay. A little bit a little bit sluggish there at Visa today. So what did we see? Well, we got the same sort of thing we got for most of this kind of grown-up tech sector stock, this is what I call it. We got good earnings. 11% earnings surprise, and then the market tanked. And why? Because all of these stocks like PayPal and Amazon and everybody gave out Q3 forecasts that were a bit more cautious. They were basically saying, well, you know, we don't quite know what's going to happen. And Visa, of course, it depends on whether people are shopping and spending and COVID and all these things. But look at <laughs> look at this here. So if I put a, an arrow in where we had the last earnings call, the quarter before, can I get an arrow? Um, so that was the last earnings call here. And then you can see the, the most recent one here. So does this, can you see the pattern? It's basically the same thing. Rally up to earnings, crash after earnings, rally up to earnings, crash after earnings. And I suspect it'll go back in that direction because it's just a good company. They have wonderful margins, uh, hugely profitable, massive mode. I mean, who doesn't have a Visa card? I mean, do you know anybody who doesn't have a Visa card in their pocket? Uh, yeah, you might occasionally use your Amex or your MasterCard or whatever, but you are going to use the Visa card most of the time. So, you know, it's just accepted everywhere. Uh, loads of bills run through it. They just make money and they'll continue to do, do so. Largest financial institution in the world. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. It's a brilliant business. They have incredible consumer data on what we do, where we go, where we live, what we spend. Uh, they know more, more about us than we do ourselves. So it, it's just a brilliant business, I think. Um, Eric says, okay, chart. So, okay, I didn't give you a real sort of chart analysis here. I just think this is this is sort of more my fundamental view on that. I'm very happy to pull up some indicators on this, say RSI or something like that. So they will all be pointing down a bit and they are just recovering. So if we put a, um, this is 50 point line. The green line is basically my, my signal line. So when that purple line crosses from below above it, it's a buy signal. And we just got that, I'd say, at the end of Friday. It looks like that to me, like we just sort of touched it. So almost a buy signal or just about a buy signal there because, well, why? Well, we've had basically two days of recovery. Maybe it'll take one more um, to, 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 to keep going back up. But I mean, just look at this from a longer term perspective. Let me close this down here and make this a bit, bit bigger and just see 
see what Visa does. So yeah, it has its ups and downs. It has its bumps. Uh, if it does ever drop below the 100-day moving average line, which is the orange line here, I always think it's a great opportunity to buy. Uh, much like QQQ, it just keeps going up. And why? They are just incredibly, insanely profitable uh, and great margins and, 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 and so on. Um, Uh, Afar, um, good stocks for discounted um, discount averaging. I mean, basically good quality stocks that have high profit margins, lots of free cash flow, and uh, have decent revenue growth, good return on equity, good return on capital. Uh, and to name a few things like Microsoft, things like PayPal, things like Visa, um, you know, think also companies that people use every single day. Starbucks, to an extent, I think people are sufficiently addicted to, 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 to pretty much go there every single day. And I prefer those stocks to, say, an airline who have massive capital expenditure, massive overheads, fixed costs for maintaining that plane and these kind of things. Visa doesn't have that. You know, does it cost them anything because you swipe a card? No, they make money every time you do it. So I, those are the kind of businesses that I, that I look, look out for. Um, I, think you are, I think you are on the on the Patreon, I found there is a, is a whole list of my core portfolio on there as well, which you're very welcome to check out. And you can, of course, also find that in the Master Stocks course down below. I give you my, my whole core sort of reliable portfolio that I buy every two weeks. That's my new plan. It was every month before, now it's every two weeks. And I keep doing that, and I buy it irrespective of share price, in fact. Um, I'm also super excited, if you don't know already how excited I am, by the Double Your Income in 14 Days course. It's just out. It's the pre-sale. It's got about two weeks left to the official launch. And during that time, the first 100 people who sign up get that 40% off coupon. And this is not an investment course. This is a money-earning course. So helping you build that side business that will make passive money for you, that is automated, that runs itself, that makes you wake up in the morning, look at your inbox and go, wonderful, I've got orders from happy customers who appreciate what I do. And you don't even need a business idea for it. Uh, I'll give you the business idea if you if you don't have one. So check that out. It's on my website. Uh, if you just click on, on the the banner at the bottom, learn more, uh, you will you will see everything that's in there. And it takes you through literally every single step. You don't need to be entrepreneurially minded. You don't have to ever run a business. You can have a full-time job and three dogs and six cats and tw 12 wives. You will still have time to do this. It is set up in a way into small pieces that you can do step by step. You can do this in two weeks. That's the whole plan, but you can also spread it over a couple of weekends and you can launch it and you will make extra income. Uh, and it is, of course, always comes with my 100% satisfaction guarantee, which means no questions asked, money back guarantee. So I want you to be happy. That's always my intention. Uh, and I think this really will make you happy. And just think about if you could reinvest that money, I mean, how exciting would that be? If you can take it into a compound a portfolio uh, and say you get ten thousand dollars a month from it and you invest that with let's say the s p 500 average for the last 10 years 14 percent and you do that over over 20 years you've got you have 13 million dollars does that sound insane to you yes and it is but that's the truth that's the way compounding works so having extra income that you can invest so you will earn say 2.4 million over 20 years with a side business and that will give you a return of $13 million if you just plow it into the S&P 500. Uh, and I will also tell you, you can plow it into something better than the S&P 500. For example, the S&P 500 quality segment, there are, there are ETFs that just track the, the good stocks, uh, not all the, the rubbish. That's at the, at the bottom end of that 500. So that's one way of of using the money for, or you can of course just go on holiday and have an easier life, or buy a house, or buy a car, or you know do whatever it is that you want to do. You know, a masseuse for your 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 dogs, or you know something like that. Uh, Angel, any history of Visa during higher inflation? Uh, I think the stocks that do well in inflation are those who are able to control prices and don't have severe input costs that go up. And if you think about when you have your Visa card and you swipe it, what does it cost Visa 
they get a fee from the merchant and and that's about it isn't it like wh where is the cost there for them so their 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 con transaction costs are absolutely minimal and they don't have to you know start buying lumber or or, or, or concrete or uh, you know anything like that or increase their fleet or employ lots more people because it's just it's just an automated transaction so i, I don't think inflation is really a concern for them uh, they're also sitting on tons of money they're sitting on lots of of, of obviously uh, our money so I, I don't think that's really a big issue for them. Um, stocks for which it is an issue are, as I say, those who have very high input costs. I think those are, are the ones to, to look out for. Generally, the ones with big, wide margins that Visa has. And let me show you the Visa margin. Uh, right, here we go. So efficiency. Here is Visa's, Visa's gross profit margin is 96.8%. Let me say that again. It's 96.8%. Okay, MasterCard is 100%, uh, but it's, it's, it's that sort of insanity. Their return on common equity is 32%, which is tremendous. Return on investor capital, 18%, also tremendous. And then their leveraged cash flow margin is 56%. So they have $12.6 billion dollars of sort of free cash just slushing around year after year and they're growing. So I, I don't think it's really a problem for them. I mean, eBay is on here and eBay is an incredible business, uh, but I think Visa is probably slightly better. Um, Red Edwards, uh, great to have you on the chat here. Uh, fantastic to see you again. What are your thoughts on GLGI Greystone Logistics? They turn waste plastic into plastic pallets. Okay, as in for logistics pallets, yes. Interesting business. I mean, a pallet is a relatively inexpensive item. It's a commodity everybody has to buy in large quantities. So I I like the idea from a sort of ethical point of view, but I, I don't really know the, the the margins. I haven't haven't looked at that there. And what's the um, how easy is it to replace? I know a lot of people have moved away from wooden pallets because they need to be fumigated and they fall apart. Plastic pallets are more durable. Problem, of course, is it's plastic. If you use recycled plastic, there is an advantage. So I can see from a sort of CSR point of view why that might be quite a good business for them. But I, I haven't looked into the numbers, Red Edwards. Uh, but thanks for throwing that out there. Um, uh, Angel, I didn't mean to sell you Visa. I mean, that's really not what I want to do. I always want you to start thinking about things, dig yourselves deeper and, and, and realize whether or not this is for you and, and fits your portfolio and so on. They are all these things. Just because I buy it doesn't mean you should because your situation and your portfolio probably looks different to mine. So just take it as a, as a starting point to start checking out the data your, your, yourself and think whether this is something uh, w worth buying. But I, I, I totally see what you mean from the chart point of view. This looks kind of interesting. Uh, Michael, my NEO price target is about $98. Uh, that's 12 months out. Uh, that's on the basis that we're going to get autonomous driving, we're going to get the ET7, we're going to get another sedan, the second factory will be up and running and, and, and all that sort of thing. And I think the EV world will look quite different in 12 months' time. So that's my, my price target on, on, on that one. Um, Samnang on, on Square. I think Square is a good business. It's just not a particularly cheap business. <laughs> Uh, that's a little bit the issue with that. Let me have a look at, we can do a comparison here with PayPal, for example, in Square. So PayPal is the orange one. Let me hide a few lines. Too many lines on this chart. So the, the colorful one is Square uh, and PayPal is the one below. So Square has done this incredible thing where it's become, it's gone up like a thousand percent in, in two and a bit years. Um, and so that that's my only concern with it. It's it's just it's it's at the top of its history and it's 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 a little bit on the dear side. I think it's a great business. The question is whether it's is it reasonable to have outperformed say PayPal uh, you know two and a half times. That's a little bit my my concern with it. If it took a real nosedive <laughs> I think I'd be interested, but it's so so far it, it hasn't. It just keeps going up. So it's just one of those things that's very very popular. Um, so for for that reason, I I haven't personally 
supported. But these this whole sector, Square, Stripe, PayPal, I think they are all very good businesses. It's just a question of finding one at a good valuation. So actually, why don't we pull that up? See if we can do a valuation comparison here. And do we have... Okay, they're throwing some really random things in here. Let me see. Let's throw in PayPal, for example. So that's one I know a little bit better. And here we have at the bottom um, Square. Can you see that here? And PayPal. So the, the two first two numbers I would always look at is return on common equity and return on invested capital. And for both, so return on common equity is a really good metric. It basically says if you give Square $100, how much money will they give you back in a year's time? How much money will they create in a year's time out of that? And they'll create basically $25, same as PayPal. Now, the return on common equity figure is fairly easily, I mean, manipulated is a, is a, is a negative word, but that's sort of what I mean. So return on invested capital is a little bit harder to massage. So I, I like to look at both. And on that metric, PayPal is almost three times better. Now, there could be reasons for that, but at the moment, that's what it looks like. And then free cash flow margin is another one I like to look at. And their PayPal, again, is like five times better than Square. So margin, not, not, not nominal amounts. So that's a little bit the issue. I, I don't really look at things like price book, price earnings. I think they're fairly meaningless. Uh, let's see if we can see them, but I think they are fairly meaningless. But Square is price earnings 220 times, Facebook 67 times, uh, similar triple differentiate uh, bit between price book between between those two so for me that's why i just keep buying paypal uh, i think square very interesting business but i'm not sure it's worth the risk for me at least guys if you haven't been to my website yet go on there right now and take that free part free five-part mini stocks course to help you improve your investment returns. It's entirely free. Uh, no questions asked. Uh, you get it instantly. You don't have to wait for it or anything. Uh, so I, I highly recommend you do that if you haven't already. Uh, Corey has 75% of his portfolio in professionally managed portfolios. I choose those based on a one-year head-to-head comparison amongst three financial institutions. The one that won out performed the... Oh, you didn't tell me the end. <laughs> you, you left me hanging, Corey. Okay, I performed the other by 10%. It's been seven months since I sip, sipped completely. Uh, I have 8% returns about six months. Well, that's, that's very good. I think you're, you're, you're doing a good job there. Obviously, I don't know what the performance, the, the portfolios are or so on. Uh, the one thing I would always say with, with professionally managed portfolios Look at fees, and there are levels to fees. There is, um, and this stuff really matters. I've, I've written quite a lot about that. So if you go on my website, you find some other things about that. Fees is the one thing that differentiates a good portfolio from a great portfolio. And what fees do we have? So there's the obvious stuff, the kind of you know management fees. That's fairly easy to spot. The hidden stuff is trading fees, and not everybody tells you what they are. If a portfolio is very actively managed and they trade every day in and out, they'll have lots and lots of little brokerages commissions which really add up over time. So that's one thing I always look at is, is actually for people who trade as little as possible. And then, of course, there are other potentially other fees that you might, might want to look at. So really, I would give them all a call and ask them those questions, and they should be very happy to answer them uh, and, and explain to you exactly how they work. But these internal trading fees for heavily actively managed accounts can up, add up very substantially. Uh, but I'm very, very glad, Corey, that you are, you're getting a decent return there. Um, and and I, I actually quite like managed portfolios. I have a lot of my money in a fund because I have someone there okay i pay them one percent i think a year but I, I i value that individual i think they're they do a good job and therefore i'm very happy to pay them the one percent um uh, blake says felix's fee breakdown of mutual funds and his master stocks course was very helpful a lot of things i was unaware of thank you blake uh, one of my uh, lovely students here i appreciate you, you you sharing that blake yeah there are there's a lot more to it than the sort of headline fees that people give you uh, the fund industry 
is it can be a little misleading. I think that's just the way they're set up. They don't want you to really know what's hidden in those numbers. So on, on that note, Blake, I should mention the master stock scores down below. You can still take advantage of that 29% off coupon, Build Wealth. Just go to the link below or go to my website, go to academy.org. And also take advantage. Do you want to double your income in 14 days? I will show you. I will guide you step by step how you can build that side hustle, which can be very profitable and you don't need anything for this. Also, there is this mistaken belief that you need lots of money to start a business. You do not. Uh, I can say that emphatically. So take advantage of that 40% um, off coupon there. That's because it's a pre-sale and the course launches, I think, on the 23rd of August. So that will, of course, disappear at that same point. And it's also only available for the first 100 students to, for, to say thank you for joining. Um, and Corey says, when would I realize those fees? Because I've had one account for over 18 months. Um, we're just doing very well and no mention of fees so far. Well, they tend not to mention them. They just sort of take them out somewhere. So just, Corey, just give them a call. Literally, that's what I would do. Very few people call these fund managers, so they're typically very helpful when you do. And just say, can you give me a fee breakdown? Tell me your annual fees. Tell me your management fees. What are your internal trading costs, which obviously... I expect, do I pay for them or do they come out of your management fees and so on? When do you charge? How often do you charge? Uh, and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Just have the conversation. They should be very happy to share that with you. And then you know, and then you know exactly uh, what, what, what you're paying for there. But I'm, I'm very glad you are, you are making money. Um, and Nicholas feels a bit smarter for watching me. I truly appreciate that, Nicholas. Thank you very much. I think that's a great note to round this up on. Uh, I truly appreciate you. I've got two more videos coming out today. And then I'm back with the lives on Tuesday, tomorrow and Monday. For me, our days working on course materials and course community and and creating more content for, for that side of things. So if you want to see me in the meantime, join the Patreon. There you can chat with me as well. I truly appreciate you. I really appreciate you getting the channel to almost 24,000 subscribers. So thank you very much. Hit Keep hitting that like and subscribe button. And I wish you a beautiful weekend. Forget about investment for once for a day or two. Don't worry about your portfolio so much. Go out and enjoy yourselves and see you on the next call, hopefully on Tuesday.